afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have a real pleasure today to have Jim O'Neill with us. Jim O'Neill is the former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. He is the former UK Treasury Minister and a senior advisor to Chatham House. Um, and uh, this webinar is being uh, coordinated between the family office, the most trusted financial advisor in the GCC region, serving over 200 families, and Petiol Asset Management, uh, the asset management arm, and uh, looking after uh, investments globally in the UK, um, in Europe, in Asia, and in, uh, in the US. Um, Jim, uh, I think the last time we spoke, there was a crisis, a different <laughs> type of crisis. And it feels to me that, uh, you know, you have to show the, uh, if you can call a friend, and there's always a hotline. So for us, it's the Jim O'Neill hotline, which we <laughs> pressed this time. Last time it was around COVID. Uh, and really, uh, I, I listened back to this webinar. And for those of you who are uh, really interested, uh, go back, listen to it, because a lot of the things that Jim have mentioned when uh, there was no vaccine back then, it was pretty much uh, in line with what he said and the way the market has behaved. Um, and today, of course, uh, Jim is the founder and inventor of the BRIC. Uh, BRIC acronym, uh, as you, we all know, it's been 20 years and it's still, um, people are calling it BRIC, and that's Bra Bra Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, and uh, and uh, and really, we wanted to have uh, Jim's thoughts on on the unfortunate uh, situation that is happening between uh, in Europe and between Russia and Ukraine. So, Jim, thanks to you for having us again and responding to this call one more time. You're welcome, Naji. Thanks for having me. I I can't resist, as we joked about off air, that you guys only call me when there's a crisis. Like you, you you're not looking after my welfare. You know, you got to you got to think more about me. <laughs> we call you to know uh, also where are we heading. So looking at uh, your BRIC acronym, mm -hmm. 20 years, two decades of, uh, of, uh, of this being invented, yeah. um, and looking at the assumptions you had for Russia, uh, and now we have 20 years, so it's good long track record of thinking yeah. about how do you think about these assumptions? Have they materialized some, mm -hmm. none, all? Can I just say, thank you, uh, I'll come to it straight away in a second, but let me just say at the outset, following on from your, your intro and discussion of the last time we chatted, you know, I, I, I did find uh, anticipating what would happening happen during COVID um, and about vaccines relatively straightforward by the standards of these things being, of course, always very difficult. But even before this Russian event, uh, once we started 2022 and we'd had this massive recovery in markets, I was of the opinion that there was so many issues out there that I felt quite uncertain about, that I thought uh, it, this was going to be a very tricky year for markets to navigate. And that was before uh, the Russian invasion. So it just adds a whole new degree of complexity over what was already, in my opinion, a pretty complex uh, investment market, given where valuations are. So with that in mind, let me try to answer your question. So the first uh, slightly facetious thing to say is, uh, you know, maybe I should have called it X, because if I look back over 20 years, um, and I think part of the underlying problem of Russia is both Brazil and Russia had a fantastic first decade, but a dreadful second decade. And uh, if I look at the assumptions that we made about what Russia and Brazil could do in the second decade, they both badly, badly underperformed. And the, the, you know, even though they're very different places, there is a core reason, which indirectly, I think, might explain the background to Putin's behavior is that they are two, you know, something that's familiar to the to the Gulf and uh, the region in general. They're too dependent on commodities, and unlike most of the Gulf, you know, these are countries with very large populations, and uh, they manage to seemingly never really change uh, 
And so they ride the upswing in commodity cycles reasonably well, but it leaves them very vulnerable when commodity prices turn down uh, and it exposes all the things that are wrong and the lack of reform. And, and, and in that regard, uh, by the way, China continue, despite China's own issues, China is still performing better than we assumed. Uh, and India's just about okay. Um, but let me give you a specific uh, example. And I wrote about this in an article recently. During the heydays of the noughties, uh, I, I would travel to Russia quite often and I got to know senior policymakers very well, including the then finance minister, Kudrin, uh, mm -hmm. the woman that's now the central bank governor. I got to know her well. Um, and they asked me to uh, the, the famous St. Petersburg summer forum. It's kind of like a Russian Davos. They asked me to present to the whole audience uh, a special presentation on what where Russia could be by 2020. And I, I, I hadn't been briefed by the diplomatic guys advising me carefully in advance because I only realized afterwards that the Russians would be annoyed about what I said. Because I basically said that it was unlikely oil prices would continue to rise in the same way they'd done from 2000 to 2008. And if, and if they started to go down because of Russia's poor demographics, Russia wouldn't grow very strongly. And they were really upset with me because their own presumption at the time, and this is important, I think, that by 2020, Russia would be the fifth largest economy in the world. And actually, uh, it's no longer the 10th largest economy in the world. And I often think two things of relevance. Possibly, possibly. One is that I've often assumed myself that one of the reasons why Putin has become so sort of uh, grandiose ambition about trying to rebuild parts of the Soviet Union is he knows he can't really be popular on domestic economic affairs anymore unless they undertake massive reform. And it's too difficult. And, and then the second thing with it which surprises me, and we're talking on a day where there's a lot of evidence, again, that Russia is struggling militarily in this conflict, that people like Kudrin and this central bank governor and many others, including policymakers in the West, said to me that Putin was the smartest strategic thinker they'd ever come across. But if I look at what's happened the past four weeks, particularly the scale of the response of the West, especially the freezing of central bank assets, that is not a guy that's been structurally very and strategically very smart. And I, I think uh, Putin's made a big mistake. Final thing to say, coming to your question before we go on. That's why we're, we are where we are. But I find my mind thinking it is not, it is easy to construct a scenario that if we carry on with the dismal progress of Russia is making in this war as seemingly and and then there has to be some compromise because he can't achieve what he wants i don't think putin can survive and it's not impossible that we could then go through another period of thinking that actually russia is going to reform a lot and the sanctions get lifted and we sort of go back to the days in the late 90s and early noughties when of course russia was invited into the g8 now, I would not have that as my main scenario, but it's not impossible. And so at a time where it's very easy for, for me as the creator of BRICS to joke and say maybe it should have been BIX or X, you know, as we all know with the, the, the world of finance where greed and, uh, and panic are close cousins, you know, never say never. And Jim, so... <clears throat> If you were China, mm. I mean, why would you be um, presenting a very closeness to Russia, knowing what you just described? Yeah. It's a very good question. And uh, in the same article I referred to, and, and another one that I've written recently, 
I think secretly the Chinese must be furious with Putin um, because be, for a number of obvious reasons, but at the core of it, with the, the China-Taiwan issue, the Chinese now know the scale of sanctions that the West is prepared to undertake. Uh, and if China got its foreign exchange reserves frozen, the consequences for China would be equally devastating. Unless, unless, and this is why it's so likely to be annoying for the Chinese leadership, unless China accelerated financial sector reform and truly accelerated the, the growth and use of the RMB, et cetera, et cetera. And that is possible at some stage, but they wouldn't want that to be determined by some foreign country. Um, so I think I think the Chinese, in probably my guess is, uh, if they knew exactly what Putin was planning, they they wouldn't have said the kind of scale of strength of words that they said with him when he visited Beijing for the Winter Olympics. Is my guess. Uh, Against that, I think the core answer, which does go back to some of the politics of the BRICS, you know, obviously the Chinese leadership want to find allies in opposing what they perceive to be the American dominance of the world. And so I, I think there is that underlying alliance, and I, I'm one of those in the camp that believes the only reason for friendship really between China and Russia is because of their equal dislike for American domination of the world. But I don't think it really runs much deeper than that, in my view. And what does this mean to Europe-US coordination on this? And is there a new shift in, in, in that uh, kind of strategic mm. policies between the two? I mean, I should have linked to what I said about how uncertain I thought the world was. I, you know, I should, your, your, your guests should probably take the following for every question and that I'm going to answer on that. My honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but, but as we've seen, and this is part of the fascinating thing about geopolitics and the interplay with markets. And I always remember in the early days of, of trying to understand George Soros's great success is trying to anticipate policy reaction functions, especially for macro markets, is so important. And mm. I bet Putin did not anticipate that the Germans would do what they've done. Mm. And, uh, and particularly given the coincidental timing of a coalition being led by the SPD, mm. you know, this, this could be the beginnings of a much more uh, friendly but outward-looking Germany, um, which could could have three important consequences for the future. The first, which is a re-establishment of the scale of closeness between Germany and France, which for the past decade has not been as strong as it was before. Secondly, as part of that, and as evidenced by the shift on defense spending, we might start to see a shift away from the German government, which already was happening a bit in COVID, to not being so obsessed about a very uh, conservative stance on fiscal policy. And it might mean, it might it's early days to be conclusive, but it might mean importantly for, for Europe economically that its biggest country is no longer so dependent on exporting to the rest of the world. Uh, which I think would be a good thing for Germany, because when you think about it, uh, having such a huge dependence on export growth to China and already being quite exposed to exports to Russia, as well as being so vulnerable uh, to something going wrong in the crude uh, energy and gas markets is something Germany now realizes it doesn't want to have. Uh, and so... Uh, I think it's very easy to have concluded this is a major risk for Europe, which of course it is militarily, but it all depends on the policy reaction function. Mm 
And the last thing to say in that regard is stating the obvious. I observe it the same as everybody else. We now see a reason why NATO really exists. And uh, I think the NATO alliance seems to be standing pretty firm. Uh, and I think Putin knows that too, uh, which is part of the dilemma he's now got as to how how he deals with the position he's put himself and the rest of the world in. What's your view on the U.S. position so far? You know, you mean specifically on the Ukraine issue? Yeah. You know, I think I, I, I have to say before the invasion started, I, I, I found it slightly strange that we'd get this daily uh, news update where the U.S., was telling us what what they wanted to tell us that their own uh, security information and satellite uh, images were telling them it, it very new dynamic that that certainly most of us are not experienced with in the modern world and i thought it was a bit a bit almost propaganda like but of course in that sense i was to some degree wrong because it turned out to be accurate uh uh, and and in that sense, again, uh, mixing good fortune with timing is is a remarkable thing in life. It's against the background of how of Biden having had a very difficult first year, and the whole mess of Afghanistan, and his own domestic policy agenda on fiscal policy not really going very well, and suddenly. Uh, he appears to have so far uh, navigated the U.S.'s position directly uh, on Ukraine and directly on Russia pretty well uh, and, and rebuilt the alliance between Washington and Europe, which under Donald Trump, of course, uh, was pretty seriously broken. So, I, I, so far... Um, I think the U.S. Has, has managed this pretty well. Jim, so when you think about um, <clears throat> Germany's, um, today's dependency on Russia for mm -hmm. uh, post natural gas and, and thinking about what you just mentioned earlier, which is uh, you know, bringing things more, uh, let's say, close to you and less dependency, do you feel this trend is going to be uh, broaden up to many other countries, and we're going to move from a much more of a trend toward deglobalization, uh, and uh, much more of that trend from here, at least. You know, on this one, again, I I, f I find my mind being very open. It's possible, and and one thing is for sure that we already knew from the pandemic is you don't want to have too many of your supply chains in very distant parts of the world and entirely dependent on somewhere uh, that might be a risk that you hadn't thought about. And in some ways, uh, this invasion has simply added more evidence about that with energy. Yeah. Um, and all of that suggests that we will see more and more attempts uh, by countries to try and bring things closer to home. <coughs> However, there are two big reasons why one has to be careful about going too far with that quite simplistic view, in my, in my opinion. Firstly, again, you guys in the Gulf know this inside out. It's not like you can suddenly switch your energy source overnight. Uh, and in many ways, the big thing that Germany and other European countries, including the UK, have to reflect on is the scale of our commitment to nuclear power, in particular, uh, of the so-called alternative energies. And I think Germany's got some big decisions to, to, to think carefully through about that. But the second thing is just more, uh, I'd call it human nature. We're, we're having this chat coincidentally, and we wouldn't have known this was happening on a day where the UK had suddenly done possibly some kind of deal with Iran uh, over freeing hostages. 
And there was a lot of talk here in uh, London today uh, about this, the beginning of trying to do something to bring Iran back into the fold and get more oil out of uh, Iran. And of course, as many of your uh, guests would know, uh, our prime minister, I think, is currently either in Riyadh or on his way to Riyadh uh, to discuss uh, more energy supply from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and 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 the second thing about that is this human uh, nature is is a bit deeper, and it's why I sort of refute fundamentally this this simplistic notion about deglobalization. At the end of the day, our consumers kind of want to have access to the best things they can get at affordable prices, and if that means going to different parts of the world, um, that's what they will do. You know, if somebody would have said three months ago, the UK would be trying to persuade Iran uh, to give it some more oil, people would have said you were crazy. But, you know, need creates must. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, you know, that we saw the same in COVID with the vaccine development. Uh, that I was very uh, aware of, that arguably that's the single most uh, dynamic area of global cooperation and production and distribution that the pharmaceutical industry has ever gone through. So I think there is a, you know, it's very uh, easy for the, the, the media world and indeed for a lot of analysts to talk about this deglobalization. But I, I am a bit suspicious about it. And it feels that this global cooperation is, is being faster and faster in today's world, right? I mean, we were talking about during COVID and it was quite fast how, you know, the, the road to vaccine was. Also, of course, technology, medicine have a play, but also this global coordination. You look at this one as well, and yeah. it was, I believe, quite fast, right? I mean, this is I a think change this is a, from... I think, Najee, this is a really important point you're making. Um, because of uh, both uh, the, the power of media, of, of media, particularly things like we're doing here, you know, policymakers, you, you can organize a G7 or a G20 or whatever call, you know, within, within less than an hour. And you can get the, the basis for an agreement so easily that you, you couldn't before. And then the second part of it, even more, is, of course, is the scale the power of technology, which can be used badly or, or well. And, uh, uh, and, and it was certainly a crucial thing in the whole vaccine discovery. And, I, and again, because of my ongoing involvement in global health, there are now pretty serious plans from a number of governments in the West to try and support the ambition of trying to get even more adaptable vaccines for infectious diseases from start to finish in, in 60 days. Uh, and so, yes, it is incredible uh, the speed at which this kind of cooperation can take place. Um, thinking about Europe and its future, you know, what, what would you say would be the top three agenda or top three trends that we should be, <laughs> that we come out, out of this, uh, that, that uh, we should keep in mind yeah that's a very interesting question so um again i'll say i don't know uh but my but, guess but. My, my, <laughs> but my guess today is the first the first one is what we've touched on i think the absolutely crucial central part is what is post-covid post-russian invasion germany going to be like you know, if you go back over the, what is it now, 23 years since we've had the euro, we've, we've had this slight, from, a, from an academic conceptual perspective, we've had this very strange position that the anchor economy of the eurozone has refused, essentially, to have an active domestic demand policy. So most of the European growth cycle has essentially been dependent on the US and China. And it's really quite ridiculous when you look at the population of Europe. And so the, the first thing is that that might be changing. 
And so we might be moving to a world where we have a more active German economic as well as uh, security policy, which I think is fundamentally a stronger basis for a more fundamentally long-term sound uh, currency and takes the euro to being a little bit more like the dollar. And it, and it would open the door for a truly credible pan-European bond at some stage in the future. So that, that would be the first thing to keep an eye on. And I, I would argue the probability of that may be still less than 50%, but it's definitely risen. Um, the, the second thing uh, that follows is a bit, I, I, for me at least, it's not what I see in the papers, but I find myself thinking maybe secretly and quietly some some people in Brussels and Paris and Berlin are perhaps happy that this now means p places like Ukraine cannot ever join NATO. Because if you reflect back over the period since the Berlin Wall fall, fell, whilst uh, geopolitically and some degree economically we've had this remarkable success of Poland and the Czech Republic, I think there is probably quite a bit of concern that these countries aren't really the same as Western European countries. And the idea that you can have them all eventually joining this one area, uh, you know, I think, I think it, we will find out in history, but I think a lot of important European thinkers probably regrets the scale at which the EU expanded. And now that probably will, will cease to really happen going forward because, again, it's my own opinion, there probably is some reasonably legitimate grounds that, and will be part of some deal if we get a deal, is that membership of NATO in the future will have to be rethought rather than just simply the West inviting countries. And the same, same with the EU. Um, and I, the third one, I don't know. The third one after that, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you a joke. It will be whether Manchester United... I, I was in Manchester yesterday watching Manchester United get knocked out of the Champions League yet again. And so the third one is, will Manchester United ever get back to its uh, supposed uh, justifiable place in the centre of European I, football? I was hoping this one would be at the end. but It doesn't look too good we, today, that's for we, sure. We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> how have you uh, seen the reaction of markets? Is it a classic geopolitical risk reaction? Uh, you know, markets today are quite are up. Oil uh, is back to hundred, but you know, throughout this period, and you've seen episodes uh, like these before. Do you feel yeah. this is all looks normal? It, you know, it's a, that's a great question, and the way you ask it, it you know, it kind of seems crazy to say it, but yeah, it, it is pretty normal. And I, I find it funny when I see and read what people say about how crazy the markets have been, but that must be people that have not been around much because it's reasonably normal. When you get a massive unexpected shock, you know, markets move dramatically. Uh, and so it's not, you know, it's all been reasonably Oddly, I'm not aware of any major, major. Uh, 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 obviously, there were few, some few isolated market dislocations, but not nothing as of yet. Certainly, nothing like 08. Uh, and and importantly, um, you know, you can you can as of we're sitting today, I think you can take away some interesting uh, notions. So, the bond market is weaker today in the US than it was before it started, which suggests to me, maybe we really are, have seen the peak of the bond markets. Um, and in addition to all the issues that were around before this invasion, if you think of this now idea that because of the freezing of central bank reserves, not too many you know, countries won't be continuing to build up their FX reserve holdings in the same way they've done since the Asian crisis in 1998. I, that's, I find something myself thinking that a lot. But the crucial bit, I don't see anybody uh, discuss, and this could be a, a theme for you to invite some academic thinkers on. Does this mean 
that the whole so-called uh, global savings glut uh is no longer going to be the valid framework and that so many people have thought about and if it is that's probably a new negative thing for for bond markets too uh, and i find myself wondering whether that's already starting to be evidence in the way u.s bonds trade so that's the first thing second thing is uh i i, I think and i joked uh, and again i've talked to you guys about it before the, I, I did a PhD about oil prices and the consequences, you know, many decades ago. And the only thing I learned is never try and forecast oil prices. But I joked to, I didn't joke, I suggested to a friend of mine that used to be a co-head of, of trading at a major, major commodities trader last Monday, said, is this the peak of oil prices today? And he said, you must be nuts. And I said, well, I just feel that everything is now priced in the way that the markets are talking. And he, here we are, we're nearly 40% lower than the peak. And I have a suspicion, and this speaks slightly opposite to what my first point was. I have a suspicion that whilst everybody's now talking about the fears of inflation even more than they were, actually, it might well be that in the second half of this year, because of the technical way consumer price indices are calculated, inflation is going to be coming back down again. Um, and in that sense, even though I'd, I'd remain quite cautious about bond markets, it might well be that central banks are not going to tighten now as much as people thought. Because if you look at financial conditions indicators, of which uh, you'll recall I was heavily involved in creating in my days at Goldman, we, the markets have done a lot of tightening for central banks since the start of January. And if I were a central banker, I, I wouldn't be quite as hawkish as I was two months ago. I mean, your, <clears throat> your assumption of inflation second half of the year, it means in a way tied to the resolution of, of this crisis. Uh, yeah. by then. Yes, I think that's right. And, uh, it goes back, it ties into so many other things. It's This is also partly why it's fascinating seeing suddenly uh, these these noises about Iran being brought back into the fold. And um, even more amazingly, talk about the US trying to do some kind of deals with Venezuela. I mean, it's just opening up things uh, that, that one wouldn't have thought conceivable. And if, if this means... The, uh, the the energy markets are priced in the worst of what could happen in terms of shortages, then the big source of why we've had this major rise already in consumer prices is going to start to change in the second half of this year, albeit obviously from a higher level of CPI than we have today. So <clears throat> the thesis that we uh, will head into a recession, um, that's not something that you subscribe to uh, or also whether central banks are yeah. um, you know inflation is ahead and they are late to the cycle i mean i'm going to give you a, a dreadful economist answer in on the one hand and on the other and, I, and again caveated by i don't know you know going back to where we started it was obvious to me and i think i said this on the last call we did it was obvious to me that inflation would go up uh, on the back of COVID recovery. Um, I have been quite indifferent so far this year as to what's really going on inflation. And I'm not as convinced as so many others that we definitely now have a big rise in inflation. What I find fascinating still is if you look at long-term measures of inflation expectations, such as the University of Michigan's five-year survey, which always seemed to me quite useful, it's still very stable. So it, it may work if policymakers do silly things, uh, then we could end up with the greater... If the, it, I guess what I'm really saying, if it's central bankers now have shifted 180 degrees from not really believing inflation was anything other than transitory to now being convinced it's here forever, we will get into a recession in the next 18 months, possibly the next nine months. But I don't think our central bankers live in the same sort of 
uh, ideological box that they once did. And at some, you know, it'd be fascinating to see what the Fed has to say later uh, in response to the probably hike, but I suspect we'll see some modification of their language. And it'll be very interesting to see what the Bank of England say in this regard, too. So, how do you see this path to exit from what is happening today? What would be your scenario? <laughs> you mean that you the... don't know, but uh, you're gonna hopefully give us some thoughts. On, on you, you mean on the ge on the on the conflict itself? Yes, or... yes, on the on the conflict. And how do you think this? Is? I mean, I'm, what I'm reading from you is also um, when I when I when we speak about the markets, it, the correction has been normal. You think there will be a normalization back to it has been priced in. Um, you know, inflation is going to be um, it's going to be there, but central banks, if they don't do a big mistake, they will tackle it. But all of this is also based on a scenario that uh, there will be some sort of uh, I guess, exit yeah, from yeah, this. Yeah. Thing. So I guess what I, I'm assuming, and linked to the tone of my I don't know answers, there's a probability, a reasonably high probability I'm wrong. I'm assuming that Putin isn't going to keep going down the path of, of mass destruction of Ukraine with a lot of his own people getting killed. Doesn't make sense. And yes, I like people, maybe the guy's gone completely crazy, but, you know, again, reflecting on things I learned early from looking at the interplay of, of politics and governments and markets you usually get some solution when there's a collective interest on all sides to find a solution. Uh, and I, I, can't, I can't see how Russia itself is going to allow Putin to carry on down the path that he's gone. Uh, and already, and this is you know probably just, it's a bit premature, but I'm sure you know, there is quite a bit of talk in Europe today that the Russians are deliberately now trying to back off and reach uh, an easier compromise where they can have a ceasefire. And that makes a lot of sense to me uh, because I think the Russian, yes, I'm sure Putin is, has fortified his own personal situation in the near term, but he can't live at the end of a long table alone forever. And uh, I, I think he almost definitely now must have realized he made a big error and he's got to find a way of getting out of it. Um, so that's my main line assumption. Re-emphasizing again, there's a big risk I'm wrong. Um, as that relates to markets, I, I, a friend of mine sent me a fascinating thing this morning that I hadn't seen. So uh, over the first 50 days of this year, the performance of the S&P is the fourth worst in history. Uh, and what, what this analysis shows, and rather interestingly, is it, of all those previous three occasions, the rest of the year, there's been a huge recovery. And actually, in uh, five of the other six, there was also a huge recovery. And so, if I'm right... And we see a flavor of it with how the markets have traded since last Thursday. I think we would get another substantial recovery in global equities. The third thing I would say, however, which is what makes life so complicated, and going back to how I thought about markets before the invasion, we have to remember that valuations have traveled a long way over the past decade. And there are a lot of big issues that are unclear separately from this, that those issues will remain once we get beyond this conflict, assuming we do. So uh, I think we can get a big rally that will take us back to some kind of normality. But I suspect a lot of big issues are going to remain for quite some time, including some we've talked about, such as what do what do countries do about their energy dependency? With it, what are we do we really, really want to prioritize climate change? And thirdly, linked to that, do we want to prioritize climate change over uh, income equality in the West? 
you know, I don't know what it's what it's like in the Gulf, probably because oil is cheaper. But in a place like the UK, many, many quite middle class people are petrified about the the, the squeeze on their living standards uh, that is about to come through. And, uh, you know, these are issues that are going to remain after this crisis, as, of course, is the whole issue, what do you do about the level of government indebtedness and so on? Um, so it, it sounds a little bit contradictory. I can, I can see that we make, if, if, if we're moving towards a solution, we will get a big rally. And by the way, it might well be that some Russian sanctions would be removed and Contrary to the mood today, I had a journalist calling me an hour ago saying, you know, this is the end of the whole BRICS investment business. I said, well, that actually probably ended six years ago, if not longer. But actually, if the talk today carries on, it might be the beginning of it, because the, the thing that people would invest in, because it's so cheap, would be Russia. Uh, not tomorrow, but in the next few weeks. So I think we could get a huge bounce in risk assets. but. I don't think we're going to go back to the smooth, comfortable, slow rising markets that we saw for much of the last decade, unfortunately. Life is going to be tougher. You're going to have to earn your money more. I, 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 I want to ask you, uh, we have a few minutes left, but mm -hmm. I mean, outside of this topic, uh, yeah. because you've done a lot a lot of work on the health uh yes sector. yes yes and and uh, what, what's your view today uh, in terms of uh, covid vaccine reopening of the economy is this all behind us um just uh, actually i'm glad to, i'm glad you asked me i should have said this about one of the massive remaining uncertainties that are out there you know i just traveled back uh, this morning from Manchester on an absolutely packed train. We are all now behaving that we need to live with uh, Omicron and COVID. The da daily infection rate in the UK has actually gone up by 50% in the past week. And if we ended up with a, you know, we, we all now assume it's amazing how adaptive people's minds are that there will not be another variant that is worse. But if there were, we would be right back in the middle of problems again. Um, and that is, a, is, is an issue. Uh, more importantly for the world as a whole, is, of course, is so topical. And here I'll make a, a quite aggressive comment. I cannot see how China can persist with its zero COVID strategy. You, you could do that before Omicron, but there is no way you can do that with Omicron. It's far too easily infectious. And I don't think China is going to be able to have a national shutdown. Uh, we see what happens when they do it in Shenzhen. They're flirting with it in Shanghai. They're going to have to somehow, and it'd be difficult politically for President Xi, they're going to somehow have to find a way of trying to live with it the same way we are. And in the meanwhile, and it goes back to what we touched on earlier, and here I do have some hope, I think we're not far off finding vaccine technology that they can be adapted for new variants really quickly. And that gives me great hope that we are through the worst of it. Where, where I'm less hopeful is after all this talk about a uh, major new approach to global health policy, which I've been heavily involved in, including at the G20 level, I don't think we, we, we've actually got the core message that I often believed in, never let a crisis go to waste. I think there is a danger that policymakers will, uh, which is... Why? Why? Why are you saying this? Because it's in the, in the bucket of it's too difficult to deal with. You know, the big thing that I, within health that I really focus on is antibiotic uh, and antimicrobial resistance, which sl on a slow basis is an even bigger health threat in the long term than, than COVID has been. But there is still no new appetite uh, for governments to support a shared path of how we find new antibiotics. Uh, and it's basically because of two things, money, 
and countries can't agree a similar framework because of their own domestic vested interests. And we have to, we have to, uh, however difficult that is, it doesn't matter to me whether you're black or white or Russian or Ukrainian or Sunni or Shiite, women, men, we've got to find a way of trying to make sure we've got a proper approach to future global health infections, whether they're viral or bacterial. Because uh, we've just seen for the past two years what can happen if one hits us full blown on. And there's, there's more out there unless we find a better framework. Okay, um, last question, and we have to wrap up here. Um, <clears throat> thinking about the COVID crisis, geopolitical crisis, and then crisis management in a asset yeah. allocation investment portfolio, how do you tie that in? Luckily, I'm not a portfolio manager, uh, but I not 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 managing other people's money at least. But I do have a lot of investments myself. So I, I think about, I'll answer you how I think about it. You know, I would say three things that I, I think I learn as we go through time. The first one of which is you, you have to respect valuations, even though, even though it shouldn't be the basis as to how you invest, you should respect them. Because as we've seen, uh, both with COVID and with this crisis, if a shock hits a market where certain assets have performed really well, they're the ones that suffer the most when the shock hits. And so, you know, don't, don't be greedy is my view. Uh, secondly, with it, you know, some kind of diversification obviously makes sense if you want to preserve and grow long-term wealth it, it it means that you will you you could give up all the hot the, the real momentum behind the most sexy and hottest stuff but i think time and time again i keep relearning that you shouldn't ignore having some diversification uh and be careful about rich valuations and then the, 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 I'm put it like this, I'm very pleased that about six months ago, I reduced the scale of my own exposure to equity markets. And then the, the third thing I would say is, and this is the trickiest part of anything to do with investing, you've got to trust your instinct and try to be nimble. And it takes me back to something I... I learned, uh, the, I remember it was the 30th anniversary of the GICs, the Singapore Investment uh, Authority's uh, celebration of its 30-year anniversary. There was this simple, it, and it's the first time I'd seen this evidence of quantitative data supporting what I felt. That if you really want to outperform benchmarks, whatever the benchmark is, <clears throat> or outperform the others, You've got to be really decisive at key moments. And, and if you can act, particularly of wanting to invest money when it looks like there is nothing positive to invest in anymore, that is usually a time when you're going to get the performance that so many other people are going to miss. Um, and at the same time, it goes back to my first point, is that if you've made very good money from a big move, whether it be, I don't know, tech stocks or, or China or whatever, don't get too greedy because there will always be a big move down in anything. And somehow you've got to navigate these three things together. And I wish somebody had, had trained me to do it better. Only time. <laughs> great um jim thank you so much uh we i think we covered quite a lot we even touched on the health and on portfolio management uh very much thank you for uh, for your uh presence here and hosting this uh, webinar and uh and giving us some insights around what is happening in europe and uh, thank you everybody for joining today bye now Welcome. thank you so much for having me it's nice to see you again albeit in these circumstances mm -hmm.